Thank you all for coming to hear me talk um, about originality, authenticity, and your brand. In order to become a successful DJ and producer, you have to know how to market yourself effectively. Obviously, the um, DJs and producers that have made full-time careers out of this um, you know, have to be talented musically, have to be great in the studio and as performers, but above and beyond that, I think it's really key to be able to market yourself, brand yourself, and cut through the noise as everybody in this room and the Berlin room knows. Um, it's a really oversaturated market and it continues to grow more and more. So it's very key to be able to cut through the noise and separate yourself from every other person that's trying to do what you're trying to do. So strategic outreach to both record labels and venues will be a cornerstone of your career. In this session, I'm going to teach you how to properly position yourself now as you grow. Um, one of the things that's been helpful for a lot of other artists, even independent ones, is to get signed by a manager or an agent, and those people then take over the reins of a lot of things that we're gonna talk about today, but I'm a big proponent of knowing how to do everything uh, yourself, and that way you can make sure that you have quality control, and if you choose to you know, step in at any point in time, you can represent yourself professionally and appropriately. So. In today's lesson, um, you'll learn how to create an EPK, which is short for electronic press kit, and as well as know how to send that EPK to key industry figures. Um, we're not going to be able to talk a ton about uh, DIY PR today. Um, let's get to know each other. Um, how many of you guys have performed at a festival? I'm just trying to get a gauge of like what level everybody's at. OK, amazing. Um, how many of you have released on a record label? OK, well, congrats. Um, can't wait to hear it. Um, how many of you have headlined a show, including a local venue? It doesn't have to be you know, space. OK, cool. And then how many of you took your first press photos for the first time yesterday? Good. OK, cool. So this is just another nice asset for your repertoire. Um, so who am I to tell you what to do? Um, I'm Jamie Sloan. I am the Global Communications Manager at Ultra um, here in Miami, and I also um, spearhead PR for all of our festivals around the world. So we have our flagship one here in Miami, and we have uh, festivals in six of the continents. I like to say not Antarctica yet. Um, that might be cold. And um, I started with Ultra in 2019. Um, and then obviously Ultra was one of the first festivals that couldn't happen because of COVID. So um, when festival work slowed down, that's when I started Jason Creative in summer of 2020 uh, to independently promote artists I believe in. Um, PR, I think, is not just in a vacuum of what it was five years ago for electronic music specifically. Um, getting write-ups on blogs and magazines is important, but so is pitching to Spotify and YouTube and doing Instagram takeovers. I set up Reddit AMAs. So just to give you a little background about what I do, I really believe in holistic promo. Um, I think that editorial write-ups are like a small piece of the puzzle. And um, that's just something to kind of keep in mind when I'm telling you about all of these different strategies is to try to present yourself you know, holistically um, and, and cover a lot of bases. So right now, my clients include Sweat It Out and Space Yacht. On the label side, I also do Pop Gang Records, um, Insomniac, sub-label Lost in Dreams. Um, I do stuff with Mad Zoo. I also do PR for Wax Motif, his album's dropping next year, finally. Um, uh, Audion and uh, Louis Futon, and then I do PR for Huluween, Gem and Jam, Minimal Effort, which is a house and techno um, party series uh, based in LA. And then, of course, Ultra is my main um, gig right now. OK, cool. Part one is um, the anatomy of an EPK. Traditionally, promo kits were physically sent to journalists in order to secure media coverage. So if you've ever watched you know, a TV show or a movie set in a newsroom before maybe like the early 2000s, you've seen a journalist literally opening a package. And so that, that was basically how it was for a long time. People were mailing out CDs, mailing out cassette tapes, some merch, you know, kind of a promo package. Um, I would say that is relatively obsolete now. Um, I've definitely gotten a few cool promo kits for a Grammy nomination or a big album release, but that's more of you know, a campaign promo than like a traditional press kit. So everything pretty much is digital, which makes it a lot easier to 
um, send out, but also a lot easier to update. And that's something that I want you guys to keep in mind as we go through this, as your career evolves and changes, um, you wanna make sure that your EPK is always updated um, to reflect what you're doing now and what the future holds. Um, okay, so like I said, now EPKs are downloadable and multimedia driven and allows the recipient to immediately do a few things. So browse your social media pages, um, which I'm sure, you know, you guys can learn more about that on your own, but that's really a cornerstone of, let me backtrack. So all the things that we're gonna talk about today, you have to have super sharp already, and then we're gonna talk basically the EPKs, how to compile all these assets. So I can't tell you like how to optimize your social media, but just make sure if we're gonna link to that in an EPK, that it's something that you're proud of and something that you would want a venue or a record label to look at. Um, so the person that's reading it is gonna learn about your story. Who are you, where do you come from, and how did you become, you know, whatever your honest artist moniker is. Um, they're gonna be able to listen to your music and understand your catalog, uh, see your stage presence, and learn more about your DJing and performance skills and just overall understand your career and vision and why this Argent's project exists, what the goals of the project are, and really ultimately why somebody should care to listen and take interest in you. Okay, so picture this. You can uh, compare an EPK to a beautifully wrapped present that succinctly contains all the information that you'd want a journalist to mention when writing about your project. So again, we're not really today talking about an EPK in the context of journalism and PR pitching, but it's a good way to think about it. Um, if you can think about an article you read on Billboard or Dancing Astronaut or Rolling Stone, and if you wanted an article or to be written about yourself, what would you want included and what would you want people that don't know about your project to know? That's how I would suggest thinking about what to include in an EPK. So, oh, perfect, I gotta have myself. Modern day EPK is less, less geared toward press, more of a general marketing promotional tool. So, you know, back in the day, people were just sending these EPKs to journalists, but now you can send it to anyone, I would say, that you're reaching out to for the first time um, and also, if, you're, if it's appropriate later in a conversation, but um, labels, managers, agents, talent buyers, A&R reps, brand sponsors, and anyone else who you reach out to professionally, especially when you're making your first contact, um, it's just a really good thing to link to, and that way that person, hopefully you're keeping that email short and sweet, can then go and read more about you and just have that on hand. Um, instead of them having to ask you additional questions, you just wanna serve everything as easily as possible to whoever you're speaking with. So you could create an EPK in a range of digital formats, PDF, PowerPoint, online as a tab on your website. Um, I like PDFs. Uh, I like PDFs. Um, I think they're the easiest to um, digest. And I certainly don't know anything about graphic design, as you can see from my very um, basic PowerPoint. So today we will discuss how to build a winning EPK the various elements that you need to create your EPK, and then perhaps most importantly, how to distribute your EPK. Okay, cool. So what belongs in an EPK? Okay, so each EPK will vary based on the artist's project and aesthetic, as well as your level of experience notoriety. There's no one size fits all EPK. I've seen so many of them. We're gonna go through, I think, five examples that are distinctly different based on what level those artists are at. Um, so just keep that in mind if we are talking about one of the sections and you are thinking in your head, oh gosh, I don't have anything of value to add there. That's quite all right. Even a brand new artist, and we'll give you an example later, can have a really dope EPK that presents well without having a lot of career accomplishments to show for it. Um, so yeah, developing acts will have less uh, notable accomplishments, but you can concentrate more on your backstory, your vision, upcoming projects, also design and aesthetic. Um, an established artist should include, you know, what they've done. It's, it's, it's kind of like a humble brag, um, and it's a really good way to showcase yourself. So the main elements that you should include, everything, you know, is if, if applicable, um, your biography, press photos, discography, logo and branding, if you've gotten that far, um, press coverage, uh, touring history, video footage, media folder, and contact info. Um, okay, so your biography. I suggest 
formatting we'll talk about later, but I really like EPKs most of the time that have the biography at the top because your biography is a really great way to engage the reader as soon as they open it, um, hook them in to your story, make them invested in your brand, and entice them to listen to your music, and also just quite frankly to read on to the rest of the document. Um, uh, this is kind of a rule of thumb for everything, in my opinion, um, when it comes to like promo. Make it short and sweet. Um, for you know, developing artists, anyone that it's not is below maybe like a middle tier of a festival. I know this is again like kind of like vague, but I think that two paragraphs is great for someone that's below mid tier, however you define that. Um, and we'll go through some examples of longer ones um, and talk about why things are you know helpful or maybe like a hindrance. Um, but short and sweet is kind of a good rule of thumb. You want to just include notable and differentiating information. Um, make sure everything is well written and grammatically correct. And again, same thing we'll talk about for photo and design. But if you have budget, I've seen bios done for $500. I've seen bios done for $100. And if anybody feels moved to get a bio written after this and doesn't feel that this is really their strength, please feel free to reach out and I can connect you with various people that I work with. Um, so don't stress out if you're not a journalist. Um, I'm assuming most of you are not because you're you know, DJs. So um, we can't all be good at everything. And this is just a helpful tool for you guys to understand what should be going into your bio if you decide to hire someone and if not. I've also have a lot of clients who have written them themselves and they're very genuine and earnest and it does translate well. So it doesn't have to be this um, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning description of your life and career. You could totally DIY it and you could totally hire someone for a reasonable price. Um, so my friend Kat Bine, um, if you, you guys should read her work anyway because she's fantastic. She's an amazing music journalist, uh, writes for Billboard, but she told me something that's always stuck with me and that I feel is really applicable here and that's show, don't tell. So what does that mean? Instead of me writing, instead of a bio reading, DJ Max McKinnery is the next artist to watch in the tech house world. OK, well, that's somebody's opinion, whoever wrote that. Um, so that would be, you know, telling someone. But if you wanted to show that, you would say DJ Max McKinnery is the next artist to watch, rising artist to watch in the tech house world, as evidenced by his opening slot at Ultra, charting in Beatport's top 10, and cosigns from the likes of Jamie Jones, Lee Foss, and John Summit. I just obviously made all that up. But, you know, that is the way that we're going to show what we're saying, not just telling it, because if you're just using all this flowery language, that's really your opinion, and if you don't have the facts or you know experience to back it up, I think it really falls a lot of the time on deaf ears. So something to note is you know avoid the hype and self promotion, and if you're going to make claims, make sure that they are valid and that you can back them up. Um, communicate the artist genre and style. Again, this is super important, but you don't want to go on for sentences and sentences about your synth work and your, you know, instrumentation. And I think, you know, just try more, more, less is more. So just make sure, you know, people get it. You don't have to say it more than genre, a few descriptions, maybe set the scene. Would you see your music being played on a beach or at a packed festival set or at 4 a.m. in a sweaty warehouse? There's ways to describe that without going very specifically into you know, the hardware or the software or just the actual sonics of it because it's really not, again, you're just telling someone, it's not really super captivating. So you want to more like set the scene and describe it quickly instead of going on and on. And that's, you know, if you want to do interviews later in your career, that's when you can really get into the nuts and bolts, but it's not certainly appropriate here. Um, again, c for people who have career highlights to note, this is where you're going to talk about your career highlights. Upcoming releases, any uh, past releases as well, um, impressive statistics, and big collaborations. Um, this is, again, why I suggest doing it maybe if you do it yourself. Try to get it in a format where you can update things, because I've seen it done a few ways. You can kind of make things vague, 
which works because if you don't want to keep updating it, or if you have the bandwidth to just make a quick change every few months and say, okay, now this song, if you put out a song in July, now it's hit 10,000 Spotify streams, that's something you want to know. Or if you said, and next, next spring we're doing a headlining North American tour, now spring has passed, you want to make sure that things are in present day. Um, and it's definitely like a little cumbersome to update things, but if you stay on it, it's not that bad. Um, and I think it really like makes an impact when you're getting something that's all outdated. However, don't be afraid of say, sending something if you get a graphic designer and don't have access to that person to update it and get outdated EPKs from big artists daily. So, you know, it's not, nothing is the end of the world, but if you really want to do the best possible thing, this is what I would suggest. Um, okay, and the notable achievement and differentiating backstory elements, and we'll talk a little further about uh, the backstory in just a bit. Okay, so easy do's and don'ts. Um, you know, your style and sound, career highlights, release statistics, big collaborations, and show bookings. Um, I meant to touch on this before, so release statistics. Have any of, have you guys heard of uh, the website 1001 Tracklist? Okay, cool. So um, I don't know if you've used it in this way, but if you put out a song and you think that there's a chance that maybe you know, if you put it out on a label and it was sent to a record pool, or you know some people, or you're just wondering, hey, did my song potentially get picked up? 1001 Tracklist is a really good website to go on and see if your track was played on a radio show. Was Did BBC pick it up? Did Tiesto play it in a club in Amsterdam? Whatever it is, they have really good AI and they can track that and you'd be surprised. Um, sometimes people who have no promo, it just gets picked up for whatever reason. So, or somebody just went and bought your music on Beatport. Like that happens all the time. I have a lot of uh, developing artists that I work with and they're like, whoa, this was on Sirius XM. Like, did you send it to them? Like, no, I, I didn't send it to that person. So, you know, it's always really good to check and you'd be, you might surprise yourself. Um, further to that, there's an app called Sound Song Stats, which that's when Tracklist created. It's not free, like the website, but it goes into more analytics and you can see, you know, did your track chart on Beatport? Uh, how did it get added to any official Spotify playlist? Is it on House Nation YouTube channel? Um, and then also the other things that we just discussed about radio play, what have you. So, you know, if you, I think it's like $10 a month or something. Um, if you're putting out music, I think it's really important to be tracking that, to put it in your bio and your EPK because the crux of everything that we're talking about today is how to legitimize yourself. You want to hook the reader, like we said, and make it interesting and compelling, but also all of these things are to give yourself clout, for lack of better words. And if you're saying, okay, Chami played this song that I put out, the reader is going to be more apt to work with you, be interested in you, than if you have nothing like that. So, you know, it, it's twofold. You want to make sure you're tracking anything that could be interesting to note and then presenting it in a concise way. Um, don't include childhood history, personal anecdotes, and fluffy adjectives. Um, we'll talk more about this in just a second, but something to note is um, if it's, whether you're doing this in PowerPoint or um, a PDF, however you decide to create your EPK, I would suggest putting something like a, a media folder at the bottom. Um, and most of the um, assets we're gonna talk about today, you're gonna want to present it um, visually in the EPK, but also have it linked out, everything in the media folder. So what I mean is you're looking at the EPK and at the bottom it says maybe media or download, multimedia, whatever you wanna call it and it has your bio as a Word document. You're going to have high-res versions of the press photo. You're going to want all these things because say you reach out to a promoter using these tools and it works, um, then they're going to want to download your press photo and potentially crop it out and put it on a background to put on the flyer. They're going to want to copy and paste your bio to use it as the social media caption for or the Eventbrite um, you know, listing, and it's hard to pull those. You, it's basically impossible to pull those assets from a PDF of what you're presenting as an EPK. So it's good to have all these things additionally in a downloadable, concise place. Um, and then, you know, for reference, Paradigm Talent Agency's website and Resident Advisor are both great resources for, resources for artist bio examples. Um, they're also our 
you know, poor bios everywhere. Um, so not just because something's on Paradigm's website doesn't mean it's a great example, but um, most of the time, you know, it's, uh, it's a good place to start. Um, OK, so what is the backstory? Um, a backstory in general is a series of events which details experiences leading up to present day. In this case, you want to hone in on your backstory in general for your career. Um, obviously, today we're specifically talking about your EPK and, in this instance, your bio. But um, it's really important for explaining, like I mentioned earlier, who you are, why you are who you are, and why people should care. Um, You'll also be able to use your backstory um, for different marketing. And just it's really important to identify that, because I think that's the basis of not only your visual branding and your aesthetic, but also you know, how you're representing yourself and how you're branding yourself um, as you know, a career artist. Um, it's also going to help fans, writers, agents, managers, label heads, a &R reps, and talent buyers connect with you. And you know, again, cutting through the noise, differentiating yourself, setting yourself apart, and making you, letting your authenticity shine through, and compelling people to invest in your project. OK, so if you have a truly enticing backstory to share, you could create two versions of your bio. So the shorter bio should summarize facts. So this is what we were talking about with the two paragraph. Um, version, um, you know, things like where you caught your first break, impactful releases, notable successes, really fact-driven. You can kind of think of it more as like a resume. And a longer bio can delve into your journey, highlighting hardships, inspirations, and personal flair. So I'm a white Jewish upper middle class woman who didn't really have a lot of hardships that I can, you know, s credit for who I am. And I have this conversation with a lot of my artists who, you know, are looking at other like really inspirational, moving stories. And they're like, well, I don't want to even, I don't have anything like that. You know, I just like learned how to produce and now I'm here. And it doesn't mean that you have to be disenfranchised um, in order to tell a compelling story. Everybody here has a story. And I think, you know, I'm right now like specializing with a, working with a lot of underrepresented voices because I think it's really important. Um, that's like, you know, most of my roster right now. But um, it doesn't have, you don't have to go into anything that you've been through. However, it's a nice thing to have as an option if it's relevant to you because with music, you want to your music to connect and you want to resonate. And I think artists, you know, a lot of the time are able to derive a lot of inspiration from hardships and trials and tribulations. And not only that, but your listeners, it's resonating with them because you're being vulnerable. You're putting yourself out there and you're, you know, sharing an experience that might be relevant to the listener or the venue buyer, whoever it is. So just something to keep in mind. It doesn't have to be some you know huge story that can be turned into a movie everybody has a backstory it's all just about figuring out what that is and how that's authentic to you so outside of being a, the bios foundation backstory can be helpful for marketing a release tour other announcements i kind of touched on this before but why did you decide to become a dj or producer and how did the producer come up with the idea for their next track and how do these two producers come to collaborate? These are all kind of just questions that the marketing team, or you know, if you're your own marketing team, would be posing. Um, a really good example of somebody who does this really well um, is my friend Mike. His artist moniker is Rinzen, R-I-N-Z-E-N. I would certainly recommend looking at his social media whenever you get home. Um, also, you know, caveat, he used to be the editor of Dancing Astro. He's a very good writer, so don't think this is like the golden standard. Um, but what he does is he really goes deep. So instead of just posting, just drop my new track today, link in bio, he'll say, what was this track informed by? What was it inspired by? Did he you know, record samples um, walking around a market in Japan? Did he, you know, did his parents play something that triggered, that he triggered in his mind later, years later? Whatever it is, um, it really helps, I think, to 
put that information out there, especially developing artists, because once again, you're really just trying to connect. This is all about how are you gonna connect and how are you going to differentiate yourself? And these are really good tools to do that. Now, I also used to do PR for Claptone, for example, who is anonymous. So if you are choosing to not take any of these routes, that is certainly fine. There's no one size fits all for EPKs or bios or backstories. These are kind of just some gen general suggestions. But you know, if you want your aesthetics to be really moody and really, you know, um, enigmatic and mysterious, like that's also quite all right. We've seen it work with a bunch of artists. Um, so don't feel pressured to wear your heart on your sleeve. I'm also like a publicist, you know, so I would suggest for you guys to give, you know, give as much as you can because there's more to work with, there's more stories to tell, but certainly it's not mandatory to go into anything personal if that's not how you want to present yourself. Okay, so the components of a backstory. Your origin, uh, winning origin story is shareable, memorable, stands the test of time, you know, discusses your trials and tribulations that help the reader invest in your success. Um, if you do discuss struggles, always make sure to directly connect them back to how they influence your music and your career. Um, I used to do PR for an artist called Gasly, who's really a lovely person. His real name is David. Um, and he is very open about his backstory where he was homeless and living in a van on Venice Beach and making music in his van. And he doesn't, you know, when he's talked about this in interviews, I mean, he's very earnest and authentic, but he doesn't, um, it's not like presenting a so sob story. And he says specifically, and that's when I made this song or that experience is what informed this inspiration. So instead of just kind of saying like, I went through X, Y, and Z, period, you wanna make sure that if you're bringing something up, it ties back into what you're doing with your music and your life. Or if you're you know, a musician who is doing an advocacy fundraiser, whatever it is, make sure that you're connecting all the dots. You're not just kind of like, for lack of better words, like emotionally dumping through your backstory and then kind of walking away. And then also, I guess this is a good time to point out. So the backstory is more of a concept. Your backstory can be a, um, a bullet, a bullet point list or a chronological list of events that have led you to where you are today. Or it can be a personal essay that you've written in multiple Google Doc pages. Like it doesn't have to be, it's not like a, an actual asset. It's more of like a concept that you guys can take, like I said, into your marketing, into your EPK, but don't, you, you're not picturing a backstory like you're picturing like a bio, which is, you know, this paragraph and this paragraph. Backstory is more like cerebral. So um, you're not gonna, you don't have to have every single component that we're gonna go through right now. Just um, wanted to throw that out there. Um, okay, what is your vision? Uh, what is your, what's your music trying to convey? Um, this is again your chance to, recon the, to connect with the reader on an emotional level. So I kind of touched on this a little bit before, but is your music gonna soundtrack clubs and festivals or do you think it's gonna be, you know, played when somebody's like cooking a romantic dinner for their partner? Um, is it talking about love? Is it talking about loss? Uh, are you discussing a hot button political topic? Is there a greater mission? Is there, you know, kind of like a point that you're trying to drive home? And that can be, once again, like track specific, release specific, tour specific, or project specific, or it could be, do you have a larger vision? Do you have a larger purpose? Whatever that vision is, it could be small, it could be big, just kind of hone in on that. Um, your culture, so uh, what shaped you and your proje artist project's identity? Where does it stem from and who can relate to that? So did your upbringing shape your sound? Um, is, is your project a manifestation of years embedded in the punk scene? Um, I've worked with a lot of electronic music artists who, I don't know, this is kind of like a, interesting trend, but I guess it makes sense, um, who were in screamo bands. And now that they, now they are, you know, making like thrashing electronic beats. Like that stuff is interesting. Like, were you in a symphony or did you grow up like going to the symphony? And once again, some of these things might be a little superfluous. You don't want to include every single thing that like flips through your head in the bio, but it's good for you to have this kind of brainstorming session internally or with your team. And that way you can take the best bits. Um, a really good example, and we'll talk about him a little later um, when we go over his EPK, but one of my closest friends and clients, uh, his project is Monsieur Frazier. 
Um, he grew up in South Central LA, but his dad was a DJ in Baltimore, and his mom was a two-time Olympian. And so he, that really shaped his upbringing, what he listened to, and um, when I got him his interview with LA Weekly, it was a big cornerstone, I think, of why they decided to write the article about him, because it's interesting, right? Like, I want to hear more, and now that I know that, I'm listening to his music, I'm like, yeah, I can kind of like, it's not Baltimore Club music whatsoever, but I can kind of feel like, you know, I can picture his dad playing Baltimore Club music growing up. So, you know, it just, it, it's a way to connect further. Influences, um, kind of just touch on this, but what musical acts impacted, impacted the artist's sound and gives listeners context is where tracks, various elements may be drawn from. Um, you know, I can't reiterate this enough. Uh, have this brainstorming session and then put together whatever like document, whether it's a list or an essay, a free flowing chain of ideas. You don't want to put every single artist that has influenced you because it's not super interesting, right? If you have a good way to connect it, like, oh, I grew up listening to the Beatles and I loved, you know, the scratchy vinyl samples and that's what I'm using in this album. You know, I'm just making stuff up. But, you know, uh, if it's something specific, great, or how Motown is influencing you, whatever it is, you don't want to have a whole laundry list that actually goes out into the public but it's good for you to have internally um, as a reference point. Um, so never embellish your backstory for the sake of marketing and sensationalism, like I said, and this is why I put this at the beginning. If you don't have like a really powerful moving story that is like the reason that you are the person you are today, that's okay. You know, like I don't really have one. So that's okay, we can all be successful and it's really just more about staying authentic and true to the facts and who you are. And so that's, yeah, every one of you does have a personal experience that you're emanating through your music. So find that and hone in on it instead of trying to, you know, make the biggest splash with the craziest, most unique story. Okay, I love this example. Uh, he's such a doll. So Duke Dumont, um, I didn't know some of this, so I think it's really interesting. But before becoming a superstar DJ, Duke Dumont, he was a semi-professional football player and competed for Great Britain's youth team at judo. And this is also, I bring up this example as well because he doesn't have like, you know, some sob story and obviously he's been like very successful. So just don't, don't take that, that as a, like a mandatory situation. So he gave up his athletic ambition to pursue a career in music and worked as a ringtone creator to make ends meet. I don't know if you guys remember ringtones. This really brought me back. Um, and then after two years, he was fired for spending too much time on MySpace and basically, you know, like messing around with the music instead of churning these out. Um, but that ultimately pushed him to pursue music professionally. And he credits his years of writing ringtones that he thought should have been hits as a backstory of why he knows how to produce a catchy dance record. So he's said this, you know, in an interview with The Guardian and many other times. Um, and I think that's just like fascinating and really unique. And you don't have to be, you know, a ringtone maker again to have like a dope story. But I think this is a really interesting version of something that maybe you haven't thought about. Like there are things that have happened in your life that maybe you haven't connected the dots of exactly how they have informed your music career. But um, try to think back, you know, and really dive deep into who you are and where you come from. And maybe you can see how some of the dots will connect. And perhaps there'll be something interesting that you can share um, and credit back to, you know, what you're doing right now. Okay, photos, which is really important because they're the first visuals that are going to connect you with the reader. You need them to be professional, inviting, and authentic. The headshot style shot, because that's what you guys got. Um, I set in a white background because when I when I mentioned earlier, you can crop, you can be cropped out of that photo into a show flyer. However, that is not the main image that I would have in your EPK, but it's a great thing to include in that media folder that we talked about. Um, however, your headshot style shot to include in your EPK. Simple, clean, maybe some cool lighting, cool background, but it's just you, your face, and not much else. Um, so you definitely always want to include one version like that. The second um, opportunity is to include a photo of you performing live. If you have a great photo of you at a club, at a festival, whatever it is, even you know, if you're DJing at home and you have a, like, a lake in the background, I don't know, something that looks visually appealing, um, it's better to not include a live performance photo than to include one that is low quality. 
I think it just like kind of cheapens your brand uh, and it's better to just totally leave it out. Um, and you can put, you know, multiple um, headshot style ones or I don't know if you guys like talked anymore about photos, but um, if you're gonna do a photo shoot with someone, you can bring multiple changes of outfit and you can do multiple backgrounds. So it's good to, um, you know, it's okay if you don't have a performance photo because hopefully you have something else that you can include. But um, a, a good rule of thumb is one landscape and one portrait option um, so that, you know, whatever uh, somebody's pulling from that media folder, if they need something landscape, they have that. And if they need something portrait, they have that, um, feeling whatever need. Aim for high resolution, high quality JPEG images with minimal compression. Um, a few of my f photographer friends help me put these um, dimensions together, but um, this is a good rule of thumb is what you know a few of my photographers have suggested. And then again, include the high quality photos with photo credit in the media folder um, for people to download. Okay, tips for taking great press photos. So considering hiring a, st hiring a stylist of budget allows, well, let's back up a second. So you guys obviously are in a really good place now because I think you all got a few, are gonna get a few photos from you know, Beatport. And what I would recommend for the EPK, but also beyond, is to hold some of those back. Um, I always suggest to my clients every six months to do a refresh. Um, and I also suggest, uh, by refresh, I mean changing the photos on Facebook, Spotify, Beatport, Twitter, you name it. And I also really like when uh, that an artist has the same photo across all of those platforms. There's certainly people who don't do that and are very successful. I just like it because I feel like it's holistic branding. Um, and also the reason I suggest to change it, you know, every six months is you're refreshing yourself. And when you're going on somebody's newsfeed, they're gonna say, oh, I don't recognize that. And they're gonna click. I mean, I personally do. It's not always a DJ, it's just my friend. But, um, you know, it grabs the attention and it doesn't, you want anything to get stale. So if you guys have five photos that you're gonna be able to pick from, I would maybe use one or two and potentially hold some back for the next time you wanna kind of revamp something. And it doesn't have to be every six months, it can be every few months if you want to time it around a release. You just want to have like fresh content churning out at all times. Um, and you don't, that doesn't mean you have to do six photo shoots, right? Like you can have the six photos and stagger them out. Um, that would be kind of like my suggestion. Um, with the EPKs, you don't have to keep changing out the photos, um, but I wouldn't give all of the photos as options because that can be overwhelming. Like I was just helping the Wax Motif team like go through their like lots of, select, uh, lots of photos to pick selects because you want everything to be translating in the same way and you want your photo kind of becomes a brand recognition in a sense. Um, so on that same uh, notion, uh, you consider having a stylist if your budget allows. Obviously, focus on hiring a photographer first for your next few you know, shoots. But if you can hire a stylist, or if you have a dope stylish friend, um, maybe they can help you to pick a few outfits. Um, you don't want stuff that's too distracting. You don't want a million colors. Uh, you want to make sure that it's looking clean and crisp digitally, uh, not just that you look cool in person. Um, so a stylist can really help, but if not, you know, a lot of the times a photographer can also advise on, hey, that's a really busy pattern. I don't think we should do that. And then definitely, um, if you're gonna hire someone for a shoot, uh, make sure to bring a few different clothing options so that, you know, it looks like you have a year's worth of content or more at that point. Um, and you don't have to be a model to look good in a press shot. It's all about bringing your personality and aesthetic to life. So this kind of parallels to what I was saying with the bio. If you're a clap tone and you wear a mask with a beak and you have gloves, like there's not really that much like we could do, right? Dynamically different photos. So we've done stuff in really cool different places, but you're not necessarily getting his personality out of that, but that's okay. Cause that's his brand. So just because, you know, if you want it to be dark and moody, that's also okay. Or if you want it to be light and bright and crisp, that's okay too. As long as your career and like your aesthetic is shining through, there's really not a wrong way to do this as long as it looks clean. And that's why I do recommend, you know, if you guys, whenever you do need more photos, if you have the budget, that's a good thing to spend it on. Okay. Um, discography. So it's not, I, I use the term discography, not like you would see it, you know, on Beatport, for example. Um, it's more just discography of your career, I guess. Um, so you want to link to your more successful releases, biggest name collaborations, respected label outputs. I would keep it to five releases max. Um, oh, sorry. So I'm picturing this as a literal list. 
um, that would maybe go on the side or the bottom of your EPK, not written out in sentences. So for example, um, John Summit, due in time, like, I would put like sweat it out, and I would put like a link to it, um, hyperlink to the Beatport URL, which is perfect because people, if they're on your EPK, they really only need to hear a snippet of the song anyway. So it's good because they can listen to the Beatport preview. Um, and also um, under that, if you have any impressive stats to share. So were you in the Beatport top 10? And if so, for what genre? Um, did KCRW play your music? Did someone on BBC play your music? Have you hit 100,000 Spotify streams? Probably not if you're sitting in this room and that's okay. Even if you've hit more than, I would say five or 10, I think that's relevant to include. Um, everything is you know, at your own discretion on a case by case basis. But you know, under 5,000, I really wouldn't point that out, but um, if you're developing artists, I think that's definitely notable, if it's more than 5,000 or 10,000. Supported by notable artists, and we talked about this earlier, 1,001 track list, and I, you know, don't sell yourself short. Always check, I would have, I tell my developing clients to check like once a month, because you really never know whose hands your music's gonna get into. Um, and then links to previous DJ sets, mixes, and live streams. Hopefully you guys have some of this. If you were streaming during the pandemic, you don't have to include a link to an hour long YouTube set. Um, if you haven't played Boiler Room, that's quite all right, is what I'm trying to say. Um, if you have a sizzle reel or maybe like a recap video of a show you played or like a tour promo, anything that's showing you DJing, it doesn't have to be literally the actual performance footage, um, but you want someone to get an idea for your style, your stage presence, your energy, and you know, if you have, if somebody can pan to the crowd going wild, that's obviously a great selling point. So, um, but if you also just have a live stream, that's okay too. If you have an hour long live stream, I'm not saying don't include it, but don't think that you have to have this or that. And then of course, um, if you don't have any video footage, sound, you can always upload to SoundCloud or if they're gonna take it down, MixCloud, that's something that everybody who is calling yourself a DJ and making an EBK should absolutely have. Whether it's something that you recorded on Ableton or you recorded it at a show, rip the audio and definitely put that out into your EBK and also into the world because you want people to see, you know, hear what you sound like when you're performing. Um, okay, cool. Uh, logo and branding. Um, price your logo prominently at the top of the EPK. If you don't have a logo, I would definitely invest in one of those. And then if you have brand, brand identity elements, um, you can include those in the media Dropbox folder. So, you know, um, there are certain artists who don't want their logo changed to a different color. Or sometimes you see in a, a festival flyer that's all caps. All the artists are in all caps. And maybe your logo is in all lowercase. What are the dimensions and colors that you feel comfortable with that? festival using. So, you know, the, it, what, I would suggest doing your branding and logo as you get like further into your career. You might not have to worry about that right now, but if you do have any of this done, definitely include that in the media Dropbox folder because then, you know, everybody says they're going to approve the assets before they go out, but many times that venues do not send you stuff that you've been able to approve. So you just want to give people as many guidelines as they can have to make sure that everything is on brand because your brain is very precious and should be very important to you and protected at all costs. Okay. okay, press coverage. So again, don't be alarmed if you don't have any press coverage to include. Um, but the press section is a simple vessel for you to link out to press coverage and wins, including interviews, reviews, and features. Um, it establishes your legitimacy, gives you a worthwhile cosign from res and respected media outlets. So, and I'll show you in a moment um, some examples. If you have had press coverage, a great thing to do is to include a pull quote. Um, a pull quote, you guys have seen it um, on the back of any book that you have purchased or rented, uh, you know, taken from the library. Um, and it's just a little, you know, maybe like 10 to 15 words that's pulled, it's called a pull quote because it's a quote that's pulled from an article. And it would say, you know, John Summit, is the future of Tech House. And then in quotes, and it would say, Spin Magazine. And so that's something that you'd want to include. And then if that article is still online, you want to link out to that. Ideally, it's still there. If you're in print, like Miami New Times, it's a different situation. And that's when you can include a PDF in the media folder. It's not integral to include it, 
But if you're a developing artist and you did have Miami New Times or you did have even like EDM identity, it's a good thing to include because it shows that, number one, you understand how press works and you're actively working to, on getting press. That I think just sets you apart. But you know, on a bigger scale, having those quotes um, is basically, once again, the showing, not telling. In this case, I guess technically it's telling, but it's a respected outlet that is a curator in a sense. So Rolling Stone saying something or even EDM Sauce saying something, that's OK. You're not saying it about yourself. Somebody who is like their career is to make these judgments is saying that, and that's a really good cosign. You can compare it in your head to, you know, uh, Jamie Jones playing your track. It's just somebody that you know is legitimate in being, you know, a curator and kind of a judge of music. Um, but yeah, if you don't have any press, that's certainly okay. Video and audio, we touched on this a little bit. Um, with uh, the discography, um, but you could also make it a dedicated um, section if you have a really sick video from performing at Floyd or whatever it was. Um, you could just screenshot that video and put it somewhere on the EPK and then link out to it, and I would put a caption below. So whatever your name is, perform to a sold out show at the Hollywood Bowl. You probably don't have that, but just as an example. Um, and that's if you have a really good um, video asset. If you don't have something, if you have something that's just kind of like scratchy or doesn't, it's not high quality, uh, best to omit it um, and wait until you have something great. And once again, it can't, doesn't have to be a full performance video. It can be something like a sizzle reel or just kind of a 30 second recap video of your tour, whatever it is, an Instagram video, you know what I mean? As long as it looks cool, it doesn't have to be a movie. Okay, touring. So you want to go showcase your previous bookings and upcoming calendar of events. And this is, again, why it's important to keep your EPK updated if you have access to it as you know a file on your computer. Um, start with major cities and infamous venues and work your way down to smaller markets and local clubs. So if you've played at space on the terrace, that would come before playing a treehouse, right? Because more people are going to know what space is that are not just sitting here in Miami. Um, but also, it's OK. Treehouse is a huge accomplishment as well. So it really just depends on who you are and what um, level you're at. You can position it as has played at Space in Miami, Sound Nightclub in LA, you know, um, Brooklyn Steel in New York. Or you can say it as has performed in New York, Miami, LA. Or you can say has um, performed nationally, a uh, 10-date national tour. Like, however it's going to sound better with what you've done, you can say it that way. You don't have to say every venue. You don't have to say every market. Or you can say sold out a college, college headlining tour. Whatever it is, whatever your accomplishment is, even if it has played locally at, you know, uh, big hot spots locally. I'm just now, like, riffing, but, you know, that part you don't want to embellish, but do you see how I'm kind of like rephrasing things to highlight what you have actually done in a more positive way? So maybe it's going to sound better again that played in Miami and Atlanta, or you could say played at, you know, Melinda's, whatever it is. Just try to make it as impressive as you can with what you have. And then upcoming calendar events, um, you know, it, you don't have to put every single tour date, but you can say, uh, spring 2022 tour confirmed, 10 day tour confirmed, whatever it is, if there's something notable. If you're just playing a local venue in a few months, that's probably not relevant to anyone. Um, so I would omit that. But if you have something big coming up or playing at, you know, Ultra 2022, that stuff is important. Um, if your project is Livetronic or hybrid, uh, this is definitely where you want to explain what instruments you use. Um, don't include a stage plot. That would be a little bit of overkill. but um, I mean, if you're Livetronic or hybrid, you certainly have wanted to talk about this before in your bio and everything else that we've gotten to up until this point. But um, touring, you definitely want to make sure that people understand, the reader understands that maybe it's you and a drummer or that you bring you know, synthesizers or whatever that is. You want to specifically say that in this touring section so that you know a venue um, manager or a talent buyer who's maybe glazing over this under, doesn't miss that part in your bio and understands, OK, this is not a one-person flight. I've got to book three flights, or I've got to get a van to pick up their um, you know, equipment. Or, oh, I like that this is Livetronic. That would actually be a good fit for this other Livetronic uh, opener. So 
definitely make sure that you're very specific if you are not the only person on stage with, you know, the uh, standard equipment. Okay, for fans of or if you like. So, you know, uh, like I said earlier, we don't want to bog down your bio with your musical influences. Um, but this is a good place, not I guess as much about your influences, but um, to compare yourself. So everybody obviously feels that they're very innovative and um, you certainly are. I'm not saying, you know, if you're making Tech House to say that, you know, you're making the same exact stuff as whatever, Jamie Jones, but um, it's a really quick way to explain yourself without talking about specific bass lines and specific vocal samples. Like you don't have to go into all this flowery detail. You can just say, if you like X, Y, and Z, you're probably gonna like me. And don't, like I said, don't feel like you're putting yourself, uh, pigeon pigeonholing yourself. If you're super experimental and you're making IDM, I promise that there are still artists that you can compare yourself to and it's not gonna diminish your originality or uniqueness. It's just really a tool for the um, labels and the venues to quickly figure out who you are and they'll go, oh, okay, that makes sense because otherwise they're just reading this document and they're like, I don't know, who, who, uh, who is this person? And it's a lot of information to, st to distill. Um, and also, I, I mentioned this earlier, but it, you know, if a talent buyer is quickly looking at this and they see that you are comparing yourself to an artist and they have that artist that they're booking in six months, then maybe you know, in their head a light bulb will go off and they'll say, oh, maybe that could be a good opener. Why not give this new person a shot? I don't really have anyone that's in this specific lane. So that kind of seems relevant to where a lot of you guys are at. So you could call it FFO for fans of, or if you like, I've seen all of the variations. There's a chance that somebody reading it might not know what the FFO is, but sometimes you know people like to be a little pedantic. So either either one of those means the same thing. Essential contact info. I'm not going to bore you by reading these um, simple words out loud, um, but yeah, make sure that you have all that affiliated labels and collectives. If you're really like repping a certain label hard, or you have signed to something like Sweat It Out or Repopulate Mars, something you know, I don't mean to just keep using tech house. This is clearly like the vein I work in. But um, if you have something that's impressive, for sure use that. Um, don't feel the need to put anything on there that is that somebody outside of your scene might not know. If you have your own label, your own collective, your own promo company, that's obviously very relevant. But if you're just releasing on a local label, um, that's awesome for what you're doing, but for this purpose, maybe not relevant because they might just be like, well, I don't know what that is and why does this person think that's important? So, you know, don't, don't overextend yourself by trying to include things is what I mean. Um, this is a pro tip that you are free to ignore if you feel weird about it, but I've seen it work many times. So if you don't have a manager, that's okay. Um, but if you want to make up a fake manager, you certainly can because it's very, I think it's a lot easier to advocate for yourself if you're not the artist. Oh, there, there's a lot of pros to this. So if you're negotiating, you, you, know, you don't represent yourself in court even if you're a lawyer. That's kind of a similar idea here. Um, you want it to look like you have representation and you want it to look like somebody is you know, advocating for you. Um, and I think it just makes you look a little more professional and you have a lot more room to kind of have a conversation, ask for more things, because if you're the talent, your job really is to make this person like you, and that manager's job is to make sure that you are getting the best deal, whether it's with a, you know, with a label, it's a little bit different, because at some point they probably want to meet your manager, but if you're just like cold emailing uh, venues, um, I think, you know, feel free to put like info at or management at, and also you don't even have to put like make up a fake name and backstory for this person, just info at, you don't have to sign your email like Joe Schmo, you can just say nothing, you know what I mean? And like do the actual transaction and like you don't have to say like who you are, you know what I mean? And like are you, and then the, if they say are you coming to the show, no, the artist is just going solo. You know what I mean? Like, I, as I said, it sounds really crazy, but um, I've, a lot of my friends have had it work. And also, even just to have like an info at email, I think makes it a little more professional than somebody having to email you for whatever it is. Even if somebody wants to collaborate with you, even if somebody wants to 
uh, commission you for a remix or I want you to play their party, whatever it is, they don't, you don't want to be that accessible, right? So this is kind of more of like, you know, the allure, but also just uh, looking as professional and legitimate as you can. Part two, the art of the pitch. So this is actually quite simple, so I think we can um, get through it. Okay, so what is your pitch? Once again, we're not talking about DIY PR. Your pitch is who you're, uh, it, your pitch can be when you're doing PR, but in this instance, you're just uh, whoever you're reaching out to, and we're gonna talk today about labels and venues. And you know, once again, anytime you're pitching, why the person on the receiving end should care. Okay, the approach, understanding who you're trying to contact. If you're a venue owner and you're getting hundreds of emails a day, you're not gonna respond to everyone. Same thing with labels. You're only gonna respond to the ones that stand out. Also, I wouldn't recommend emailing a venue owner ever unless it's a small venue and they also do the buying, um, but we'll get to that in one second. That was just an example. Try to be judicious and think about if you're ready to be emailing someone. If you don't have like a really dope uh, catalog and you don't haven't already played a lot of big clubs in Miami, I wouldn't hit up space unless you know somebody there because you get one shot, right, to make that impression. And if you are kind of fledgling and not really ready for it, that might kind of leave a bad taste in their mouth, like, I mean, they're all nice people, but you just don't want to waste anyone's time. So try to just check yourself a little bit and think, is this an appropriate thing? Reach high, aim high, reach the stars, but try to, you know, figure out where you would be appropriate. So that goes into what I'm talking about here. Do your research. You should Google stock, use LinkedIn. Um, there's a Chrome extension called Hunter.io, where basically this is really helpful for PR, but maybe for pitching yourself to venues and labels. Um, if you type in Rolling Stone, for example, .com, it'll populate a whole list of people who work at Rolling Stone. Some of them are gonna be accountants, some of them are gonna work in HR, but if you can figure out what, what writer you're trying to pitch and you see them on there, great. So it's kind of working backwards and forwards. Or, you know, if you're doing clubspace.com, maybe you can figure out, see some emails and then Google, like, okay, clubspace Coloma, figure out who that person is, and then, okay, now I have the email, is this an appropriate person for me to reach out to? So for venues, you really want to be hitting who is the talent buyer and what's the capacity, again, because you want to be playing rooms that you could fill. Even if you're an opener, you don't have to think that you can fill it totally on your own merit, but don't aim ridiculously high. We're not pitching Madison Square Garden, you know? And what does our upcoming calendar look like? Um, do you see yourself kind of fitting in with the other things? I'm not saying that venues won't take a huge risk and book something way out of their typical genre, but I think it's better to start with a comfort zone situation in terms of programming. Labels, same thing. So who heads up A&R? We're not going to be, I wouldn't recommend reaching out to the marketing team. I wouldn't recommend reaching out to the digital team. If you know someone that's going to introduce you, obviously these things are not super relevant, but otherwise you really want to reach out to A&R. Um, you can email, you know, marketing people or you know somebody else on a different part of the label, you just, again, I don't want you to annoy people. So what's a label sonic style and would my sound align, align with their catalog? Elements of a successful pitch. So this is like super cookie cutter the way I did it because I wanted to give you the bare bones. Um, and once again, I'll circulate this so you can just really copy and paste it. But um, booking inquiry for venue name and you can put the date if you wanna be booked for a certain date. Um, that you're trying to pitch yourself as an opener or you know trying to pitch to a label be part hype number one artist is my client yeah go marshall um house demo for own record so that says you know back to the basics elementary school who what where when and why um what are you trying to say concisely uh to get somebody to open the email essentially keep it short and sweet i would say maximum of eight sentences include the important details who you are and what you're promoting, why that person should care, and where to read more details about the project, which will be your EPK and the media folder. So greeting, use the town buyer and A&R manager's name. Don't say to whom it may concern. I would say never say to whom it may concern ever again, even in a non-music email. It's very antiquated. Our great grandparents maybe said it, and it's, it's very impersonal. Um, try to find somebody's name, if it's just like A&R at DIMAC, for example, I think it's better to at least try to address the head of A&R, maybe his assistant or her assistant or their assistant will open it, but at least you're showing that you've tried to make an impression on that person instead of, your, you just don't want to seem like you're copying and pasting it and sending it to every single label and every single venue. So that's the point of making the personal connection. Um, these are two examples of things you don't have to have attended 
a show at a venue to pitch yourself. You don't have to. I would definitely reference something about the label if you're going to pitch to a label, but these are obviously ideal situations that show that you're a patron of either the venue or the label. If you don't have that personal uh, connection, that's OK, but you should just at least note maybe a recent thing, person that they've booked, something to show that you know them and you know what you're talking about. And once again, most importantly, that this is not a mass email, which it is, but you're making your own differentiating versions of it. Step sentence three to four, describe yourself. So expand on your sonic style, accomplishments and accolades, and what you, why you, you make a good fit. So basically distilling everything else we talked about today. Sentence five, or if you're a venue, you want to link to your previous mixes and sets, and then EPK website and social media. If you're a label, these are the demos. And then obviously, you know, at that point, you say, check out my set from blah, blah, blah. I think it would really translate well to your venue. Or here are some demos that I think that would really work well, whatever it is. Thank the person for their time. You know, just say, feel free to reach out. I look forward to chatting with you further. You can do an assumptive close of let me know if I can give you, you know, uh, let me know uh, if I can follow up with you, something like that. It just depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, and also, you know, a lot of these people, and I don't, don't think that this is a stalker thing, a lot of these people are going to be reaching out to have done interviews and, you know, uh, maybe not in smaller markets, but in major markets or any record label, most of the time these people have said things aloud that will cue you into who they are and maybe how to approach them. You could keep it super simple, but I don't know, it might be worth looking up somebody's name and then they'll say, five tips to get signed to sweat it out. Like for example, the A&R guy at Sweat It Out has literally written that as a guest post or magnetic bag. So if you're trying to pitch them, and you've Googled this, now you know exactly what they're looking for. So it's just really about making that personal touch and connection. Um, pro tips, proofread your work, and then send an email format without attachments. Sometimes if I get an attachment from somebody that I don't know, I don't open it. And I know that I'm more generous with how many emails I open than most of the people you're going to be pitching. So I just think no attachments in a, is a general rule. And now that I realize I, I emailed the Beatport um, team my presentation as an attachment. So I'm sorry for being a hypocrite. And thank you for not deleting my email. Oh, OK, we already talked about this. Um, thank you. I know we ran a little over, but I will be around if you guys have any questions or if you guys want to ask questions yeah. now. OK, perfect. Um, does anyone have any questions? No attachments. No attachments. If you're pitching anyone, but especially a venue owner or a label manager, they have so many attachments from like artists who are going to refuse to upload their MP3 or their, you know, their WAV file. People's emails are just get so crazy, especially these people that you're trying to pitch. Like, I don't want you to clutter people's inboxes. I just think it's a little unprofessional. I think everything can be done as a link. No, I, I asked her, I just, I like to approach every situation assuming that everyone is super, super busy. Yes. So would you say that's a good way to go that's through it? That's a really good way to approach that. And I also tell even my other friends like who are publicists the same thing because, you know, the bread and butter of like what I do, and that's why I was able to just give you this session on pitching, is because you cannot be offended. Chances are somebody are not going to reply, especially the first time, because they don't know who you are, and their inbox is flooded with lots of other things. And like you just said, they are legitimately busy. So you have every single thing working against you, which is why hopefully these tools will help you cut through the noise a little bit. Um, because if you're doing this yourself, this is really geared toward independent artists. So I think, you know, the art of the follow-up is very uh, delicate. I would not follow up with someone more than three times, like, ever. Um, maybe, like, another year or, like, six months down the road. But I would do, for a venue, maybe email them. Obviously, I wouldn't send any emails for the rest of this calendar year. Like, everybody's off for the holiday. You know, leave people alone right now. Um, maybe wait until, like, second week of January to implement some of these things. But. Um, Send your email. If you don't hear back, do not be surprised and do not be offended. And then maybe, I don't know, three weeks later, send a follow-up. And when you follow up, always try to have, this is good for PR and for any other pitching, always try to have a new asset. So, hey, hope you've been well. Love that new song that you guys just put out or whatever. Whatever your personal thing is, that show that I just, great booking on this. Um, just wanted to send over my news track or just wanted to show you a new mix that I just put out. Even if you literally just do a 30 minute mini mix on Ableton in your house and upload it, now you have something to follow up with. Because if you just say, 
circling back, just following up, just touching base, I don't think you're really gonna do anything. Like if somebody didn't read it or didn't care to reply the first time, this is your chance to give them something new to be interested in. Um, I think that following up without something new to provide is somewhat pointless. So like I said, a 30 minute mini mix is another cool thing. Or you can say, oh, you know, I'm working on this or I just did this or here's a recap, uh, uh, ten, uh, even like photos. Oh, I just wanted to send you over some photos of this event that I played, whatever it is. It's better than just following up. And then you can always say one more time, like, hey, I just saw that you booked this person, or hey, here's another demo I want you to check out. And at that point, if you have not connected with that person, maybe they didn't answer it, maybe, uh, maybe they didn't read it, maybe it wasn't appropriate, there's a lot of, you'll never know, but you can try to reach out to someone else at that label or venue, or I would maybe move on to some other targets. And this is definitely a labor of love, uh, pitching yourself, and it's very time consuming, so don't get down on yourself if you don't get responses. Um, and also talk to your other friends who are doing this. Maybe somebody else, you know, if they're actually your friend, if they're happy to share a contact, maybe somebody has gotten bounced around already and now they know exactly the right person and that email isn't available online. So, you know, I think it's just like following up in a, in a appropriate way and just not getting discouraged and having lots of other options. And that's one good thing about this market being so saturated is that if one label doesn't answer you, maybe go down a notch in terms of following. Maybe try a smaller club, maybe try a smaller label, maybe try a, something that's brand new. Whatever it is, you just wanna get your music and your project out there. Um, but yes, good question, and yeah, be very delicate about following up, because the worst thing is people who email me over and over and like, and I've, you know, it's fine. Like some things are very unsolicited, so I don't have time to answer everything, but then I'll finally be like, hey, okay, well, you know, just so you know, like I don't have the bandwidth for this. And like, kind of take a hint, you know what I mean? Without giving up. Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, thank you so much, super informative. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, venues, labels, all of these things are businesses, right? And I've had places like straight up ask me like what's their monetary gain for booking myself or we have a collective like the women that we, pr that we represent. Um, how do you approach those kinds of numbers? How do you present them? And they tend to vary, right? Because I know I've played clubs where they stay open an additional two hours because people are drinking, people pop bottles. Right. But like, it depends on size. So it could be an intimate club, a larger club. Like, how do you approach yeah. those kinds of numbers and conveying that to a business? Right. Um, yeah, especially venues. And it's so whack because like, it's not on you, right? Like, you're the artist. But I think that, you know, having... Um, the stats that we kind of talked about is maybe the way I would approach it. So for example, you guys are obviously based here. Like if you've been supported by Miami New Times or you've been supported by the New Tropic or stuff like that, you can say, listen, well, if you book us, then there's a chance that th these people have already supported me so I can totally hit them up and they will probably promote this. So that's good, that'll go out to their newsletter. And you could say like potentially, however, see they've, they've already supported me here. Or you can say, Here's my following, and if you really do have like a strong following locally, go to your Spotify for artists and look at your numbers. Or you can say, this is, these are the rooms that I've sold out, or these are the rooms that I've played locally. Or here, my last, and you can even say, my last um, release got X amount of Spotify listens. It doesn't mean that those, all those people are gonna show up because not everybody lives here or is available that night, but you just, once again, it's the same thing as what you wanna put in the EBK, like ways to, statistically legitimize yourself and especially if you're booking you know talking to a local venue then hopefully you have lots of local things that you can kind of point to that you've been successful in the past whether they're previous bookings or press or you know like i said looking at your spotify for artists or did you do something with like another miami art collective did you have something successful at art balls or whatever it is or you can even say, this is, an, uh, this is very specific, but whatever, this is an after party for my friend's wedding, so we're gonna bring 200 people, you know what I mean? Like whatever it is that you can pull in, there's no rule of thumb. But yeah, it's unfortunate that artists are put in that position because really it's on the venue to quantify it and they should be really looking at their pole star numbers. Um, but you know, I think that there is a very calm and like professional way to present that without being like, this is a ridiculous question for you to be asking me. And if you don't have, don't, don't think that anything's like too small. It's better to like try to say something, even if you know you got 2,000 streams on your last release. Like if, if half of those were from Miami or even like 500, like that's a lot of people for any club here. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean that every person's gonna come, but just it's better I think to come back with something 
than um, to say, I don't know, you know, even if you say, well, as you can tell, my Instagram followers have doubled in the last two years or whatever. I just saw this, this post I just posted did really well and people know I'd play that song. I don't know, you know, things can be a stretch, but it's better than saying, I don't know. I don't know if that was helpful, but yeah, try to, you know, try to just give any fact, factually based success stories that are relevant to that venue. Do, do you guys look at a resident advisor to see like past, you know, past uh, events, uh, certain talents have done, like who they've played with? Like, yes. Is it good to include in the EPK? And You're linked to your resident advisor? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's, uh, I'm surprised I didn't put that. Yes, I think that would, is great. Um, and also, you know, if you've been DJing for a while, if you've forgotten where you've played, that's a great place to look. Um, but yeah, if you have a good RA page, definitely link to it. If it's just your bio, I think maybe don't link to it. Unless you have like, maybe, uh, I don't know, now I'm just like throwing out a ballpark number, like t over 10 to 20 bookings, I would link to it. But otherwise you're kind of like showing that you haven't played a lot of shows or you're playing shows that aren't on Resident Advisor. If you're playing like clubs that like ticket through Eventbrite, um, Resident Advisor looks good if you have good things on there, but if it's just your bio and maybe a show or two, you're kind of undoing what we were doing in the touring section, which was saying Miami, New York, LA, instead of saying, you know, Melinda's and like this brewery, which are, you know, great in their own right, but we don't want to focus on the fact that you're playing like smaller rooms. We want to focus on the fact that you're playing bigger markets. So you don't want to undo that by showing that you, that it looks like you haven't played a lot of things. But if your resident advisor is sick and you have at least like 10, over 10 or 15 bookings, even if they're small, that's like, that's volume. Uh, and yeah, uh, this is my email, but also I'm on social media. It's a good way to um, get in contact with me.